Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman and we're continuing our studies in the book of Ephesians. This is chapter 1 verses 15 to 22 for September 29th, 2024. We're recording these messages in advance as I will be away on a ministry trip. Let's stop, let's pray, and ask the Holy Spirit to direct us. Father God, thank you again for Jesus, for eternal life, and all you do for us. Use the time that we have here today to glorify and honor you, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this message is Great Hope and Joy. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 22. Let's read them. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith, of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, and not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as a head over all things to the church, which is in his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. We're actually going to verse 23, not verse 22, as I said out at the beginning. What happens when we hear a good report of people who are servants for the Lord. We rejoice. We rejoice, and to rejoice means to feel joy or great delight. And that is what Paul is speaking of and speaking to in this passage. In verses 15 to 7, he rejoices in the fact that these believers in Ephesus have heard the gospel. In verses 18 and 19, he rejoices that they have become enlightened to the gospel. And in verses 20 to 23, he rejoices that all that is accomplished is through God, by God, through Jesus. So let's look at this portion here, verses 15 to 17. It means, or what I'm in, uh, wanting to get across, across here is, the believers have heard. Paul heard the good report of the Ephesian believers. And what he has heard is their faith in Jesus. That he has heard, that they are going on in their faith for the Lord and following him, it is a place of rejoice, rejoicing for him. He spent time with these believers. He went there for a short period of time. He came back afterwards, spent three years with them, and he pastored and taught and equipped these believers in the things of knowing about God. And he is rejoicing in their faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 speaks about faith. The biblical definition of faith is simply this, the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. He rejoices in the fact that they see, they hear, and they, are and they themselves are rejoicing in what God has done for them. They haven't seen Jesus, but they rejoice in him. They haven't, and they don't know God in the, in, in the flesh, but they rejoice in him. They don't know the, uh, the history of the, of the Hebrew peoples, but they rejoice in him. And the re these Ephesian believers now, in their faith in Jesus, as we look at this portion here in Ephesians 1, 15 to 22, the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen, Paul knew of that. Not that he wrote that in, in the book of Hebrews. Some people think he might have written Hebrews. Some think he didn't. But Paul would have known that adage anyways. He would have known what it meant to have faith. He, he, he had the privilege to see Jesus, to witness the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. It's where God encountered him and said, why are you, why are you persecuting my church? And Paul then lost his sight for three days, was taken by the hand into Damascus, and was there that he was met by the person he was told he was going to be met and he was to go to Jerusalem. He received his sight back. He went to Jerusalem and he went there to speak to those of what he knew were the church, the very ones he had persecuted. And they were so afraid of him, they didn't even want to see him. 
took a lot for them to realize that God had made a change in him that was real. Remember in the last message, last time I spoke about that same fact, going to be interviewed by a church in Montreal many years later after my salvation. Many years ago now, it was the beginning of the work of Israel's hope, and there was somebody there I went to high school with. He knew me in high school, and I remember him sitting there shaking his head, I can't believe this is you. That's what happens when people change. And uh, I don't want to recount what my reputation was like in high school, but that's a long time ago now. And high school became university, and university became married life and career and everything else. And when God called me to ministry, I had no choice but to go. And I did. And it's because I went by faith and evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things not yet seen. But I'm looking for the fact that I'm to serve the Lord Jesus Christ here to bring the gospel to Jewish and Gentile people here. And not unlike Paul, who had seen Jesus, but I haven't seen him. It's faith that keeps people going. This is what Paul is rejoicing of these people. For the, Look back at verse 15 again, Ephesians 1, uh, 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, the saints are the set-apart ones. We call them the saints, sanctified ones. We get our word saint from the word sanctified. To be sanctified means to be set apart. What are you set apart from? Well, if you become a follower of Jesus, you're going to become more and more set apart from the things of this world. You're going to become a person who is different than of the world. Now, I don't mean that you're, uh, you're better than anybody else in the world. Believe me, you're not. I'm not. None of us are any better. I'm no deserving of salvation that anyone else is. But God knew who I was from the beginning of time. We touched on that earlier in this chapter. Remember if you were listening uh, in on the earlier uh, messages of this chapter. This is what we have already touched on. God knew who I was. God knows who you are. You may find that hard to believe. How can God know who I am? There's three, eight billion people in the world. Well, he spoke all of creation into existence simply by speaking. And if he could do that, he knows who you are. How could he not? Now he goes on in verse 16, Paul does. Because of this faith, Paul has been influenced in his own daily walk. Look at verse 16. Do not cease, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. You see, when you live a life to the glory of God, and other believers become aware of it. It has impact upon other believers. You become an influence on them in their lives. People see things changing in you, like the person who knew me in high school years and years and years ago, sees me in a church setting years and years later and says, I can't believe this is you. Well, it's not because of me this is who I am. It's because of what I've allowed God to do in my life. And believe me, I would never have thought I would be this when I was walking around as a 15, 16 year old growing up in the North Shore of Montreal in a high school that was more than 60% populated by Jewish people and it was more important to fit in with my community than it was anything else. But God takes people, removes them from one place, puts them in another and changes what he needs to change in them. And then he influences others around them by looking, when you see another believer in their daily walk, it becomes an example of how others walk their lives as well. It is an encouragement to others. You see, it's like throwing a, a little pebble into a quiet little pond, and you throw the pebble out into the middle of the pond, and the concentric rings go out from where the pebble lands. And that should be, in a sense, what your faith walk is, that that pebble gets thrown in. That's the picture of your salvation. And it gets thrown into to the, the world system, you might say, the water. And the waters just ripple out and people watch the ripples and they see something and they want to know who God is. Can they see that in you? Now Paul furthers this in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul desires that these believers in Ephesus would share in the same spirit that he has. In order for the Ephesians to know God and Jesus as he did, he prayed that they would have a spirit of, well, 
Look what it says in verse 17. A spirit of wisdom. Now, what does wisdom mean? Literally, the word wisdom is defined as the ability to discern right judgment. Now, that's what the word means here. Now, we're literalists with the word. So, what's on the page in front of us makes sense to us as we read our Bible. And so, you are one, God would want you to have a right discernment and right judgment of things. And then it's to have not only just a wisdom, but of revelation. The word revelation means that through right discernment, God's program for them and us is clearly understood. Now, it can be clearly understood. I, I, I've met people who come out of uh, all kinds of interesting backgrounds. Catholic background, Jewish background, and these things are too mysterious. Remember we talked about the word mystery two messages ago, and it's not as we understand it in our modern context what a mystery is. A biblical mystery is something that is revealed and made clear and understood that had, no, had not been revealed prior to that time. And so you see there are things that were not clearly understood and that the early church now is beginning to understand these things. The early church made up of Jewish and Gentile people alike who looked at the world system that they were in, the Romans in pre predominance then, and realized that it was a, a system that didn't like who they were and that they would create, create be created in them uh, a different kind of wisdom, a different kind of revelation, a different kind of knowledge. The, the knowledge here is referred to in verse 17 is the knowledge of knowing the truth of God. Now, here's the truth of God. As I've said to you many times, those of you who are regular and, and look on here, the truth of the knowledge of God is this, that the most amazing thing that has ever happened in all of human history is that God became a person, a human being like you and I. God himself in the person of Jesus. He was fully man, fully God, all at once, he was wrapped up in one. He emptied himself of all of his godly prerogatives, Philippians chapter 3, and he allowed himself to go to that cross to pay the penalty for your sin, to die in your place, my place. He's done that for you. And he has an eternal place for you. It's called heaven. And you don't get there by paying your way in. You don't get there by doing good works. You get there simply by believing that the penalty for your sin has been paid in the person of Jesus, the Messiah. Hearts do not have eyes, as verses 18 and 19 may give you an idea. Look at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches, the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, your heart, there's this physical organ right in the middle of your chest that pumps out blood and keeps your your life going on a daily basis, but that's not the heart we're talking about here. And there are no eyes in that heart either. And if there were eyes in that heart, they'd need glasses like my eyes need them. But anyways, it's not that organ in your chest. It's the deep innermost part of who you are as a person. And Paul wants them to be able to see and understand that God's truth needs to be culminated deep within them as people and that they would have then go back to verse 17 they would have a knowledge a spirit wisdom revelation you see how paul very very specifically builds his argument it's like putting one brick on top of the uh, another brick of another of another he's building his argument here he's very plain and clear in, a, in presenting to us what it means to be a person who's set apart from the world, who lives by faith, who can discern what it means to submit to God, to understand his word. The Ephesians may have had and probably did have access to what some scripture, something we would call the Old Testament. Now, the New Testament what didn't exist at this time. Um, it was being written. This letter is part of what was being written. Paul was being used to write the the New Testament uh, in part. Remember we talked in the first uh, first message in the series an introduction to Ephesians where I said that Paul wrote 13 of the letters of the the New Testament of the 27 letter uh, letters or books whatever you want to call them. Well, he wrote all of those. And when he wrote all of those 13, 
almost half of the New, the New Testament. He was writing down the, the doctrine, which means the teaching, the understanding of how the church is organized, what our responsibility is to God, how we are to live our lives, etc. And we are to have this as our discernment. Now, Paul would have used what we call the Hebrew Scriptures. He would have used the writings, Moses, the writings, and the prophets. There was no New Testament. And he would have clearly presented to the Ephesian believers, be they Jewish or Gentile, how Jesus is the fulfillment of everything promised in what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. But we have this discernment ourselves because we have the completed Word. We have the privilege of the full Word of God Genesis through Revelation and the knowledge of the great power of God and this is what is referred to here in in verse 19 and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might all of this is accomplished through the predestined work of Jesus and is accomplished in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Jesus died Jesus was sent to a grave. He willingly died. Remember I said a moment ago, the greatest uh, thing that has ever happened in all of human history? Jesus willingly went to die on that cross to pay the penalty for your sin, my sin. This is what's the most amazing thing, is God loved the world so much he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is a promise that is meant by God. And the great power that's in display here is that God the Father raised him from the dead. He was Jesus, who was God, but he willingly went to die. And his death was the propitiation, an old English word from the King James Bible, the payment for sin. And now it says here that he is seated at the right hands in the heavenlies. Look at verse 20 which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 is a, a, a beautiful introduction to the book of Hebrews and the, the calling out to the Jewish believers in Rome to stop going back into the old system, the old house, and come into the new house which is now headed by Jesus, not headed by Moses and the prophets who are not as able to do what Jesus has done. And that's what Hebrews is about. But in the first four verses, it closes by, it opens and closes those first four verses by declaring the glory of who Jesus is. And when he had finished what he had to do, he sat down at the right hand of God's glory in heaven. He's above all rule, so that not just in this age, but in the age to come, he will be Lord over all. This is a uh, picture looking forward to the millennial kingdom. God is going to have the great messianic age come in to this world and he's going to rule, Jesus will rule from Jerusalem in the millennial temple for a thousand years and at the end of that thousand years Satan will be loosed one last time. There will be people who will be physically alive who will go into the kingdom who will survive the tribulation period one third of the house of Israel will do that Zechariah 12, verse 10, they look on him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9, two-thirds die at that time, leading up to Armageddon and during Armageddon of the house of Israel. But one-third, the ones who look on him whom they have pierced, they will be rescued through fire and will physically go alive into the thousand-year reign. And then Zechariah 14, 1 to 5, speaks about the battle for Jerusalem, Armageddon, as we understand it to be. And who comes in the sky but all the saints with God himself as he was not understood fully there's a mystery but he's known as Jesus they don't see him as Jesus in Zechariah 14 1 to 5 but in Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 uh, 19 verses 11 and following they see him as Jesus coming on a white horse with all the saints in heaven you know who all those saints are they're a mixture I believe of angels and you and I, resurrected ones who come taken out in the rapture, the resurrected church, the raptured church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Note the sequence of events. There Paul writing again in his sequential ideas of things. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the physical removal of the church from the world. 
prior to the great time of judgment. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 11, the day of the Lord. An ancient Hebraic statement, the time of God's judgment, the day of the Lord. The prophet Joel spoke extensively about the day of the Lord in his short little prophetic book. And it's all there for us to understand. These are the things that Paul used to reach the Gentile believers in Ephesus and any Jewish people who were there because he always went to the synagogue. And then he closes off here in verses 22 and 23. It says this, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. We live in the church age now. And because we live in the church age now, he's the head of the church. He may be sitting in heaven, but the Holy Spirit sits inside of you. Remember we talked about being sealed by the Holy Spirit and the misuse of, of, a, of a Greek word, a noun used as a verb, and the picture of you can't take the seal of the emperor off of a law and you'd be uh, executed if you did. You can't lose your salvation. You've been sealed permanently by the Holy Spirit. You belong to God if you are a follower of Jesus. And you are guaranteed eternity with him. Some people say, well, that's too easy. It just gives you the right to go out and sin. No, it doesn't. It should create within you a sense of knowing that when you do sin, that you've got to be right with God. Why do you think John wrote in chapter 1, verses 3 through 10, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. But, you know, that little three-letter word I taught on First John in here, uh, on our page here before, a little conjunction, a little three-letter word that puts together two great ideas. A little word, two great ideas. But, if you ask for forgiveness, it's God who is just, God who is loyal, God who forgives you of your sin. So even believers who fall into sin, and it happens, look, it's happened to me, I'm not too proud to say it, and I just have to go to God and say, please, forgive me. And you know what? He forgives. You know why? Because he's a God of his word. Why do we know that? Every single prophecy that pointed to Jesus coming at his first time was fulfilled to the letter. Everything that Jesus, God said to the people of the house of Israel, that Jesus would come at the right time in history, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, that he would die ignominiously, as it says in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, in Isaiah chapter 52, starting at verse 13, through all of Isaiah chapter 53. All of that is a picture of how God keeps his word. If all the prophecies pointing to Jesus' first coming have been fulfilled to the letter, go and check them out. They have been. If they all have been fulfilled to the letter, do you not know that God will keep his promise to you? And what is it, that promise that I was just alluding to a moment ago? That if you sin, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you sin, he says, come to me, I'll forgive you. He does. Why? Because everything else he says he would do, he's done. Why would he not forgive you for sin? So you see, he's above all, Jesus is. So that not just in this age, but in the age to come, he will be Lord over all. That's what it says at the end of verse 23. Verse 22. Put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He is the God of creation. He has created all things and he is going to be the ruler of this world. Our next message will be next time in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And the title of that message will be Children of Wrath No More. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can see how Paul starts his discussion points here in chapter 1 of Ephesians. We've covered all of chapter 1 of Ephesians. We're now going to go into chapter 2. And you see that you've been called out. People can rejoice in that. We get great encouragement from knowing what God has done in, in the lives of other people. And we can see that we are no longer children of wrath any longer. We're not the ones who are going to spend eternal life separated from him. <clears throat> we are Israel's hope ministries. We exist to share the gospel like this here in this medium or face-to-face, one-to-one. Let me give you an example of face-to-face -face and one-to-one. -one. Our annual Bible Prophecy Conference is coming up and it will be held on October 26, 2024. 
It can be uh, attended either virtually online via Zoom, via Zoom. We've been doing that now since the pandemic and we are continuing it. However, you can now, uh, for the last, uh, this will be the third year since the end of the pandemic, we will be meeting um, publicly live and this year we'll be holding our live meeting for our annual Bible Prophecy Conference at the Gathering House Church in Chesterville, Ontario that was just secured today as I prepare this message. So if you'd like to attend live, you can be there live. I'll be there live delivering two of the four messages. My co-speaker will be Dr. Keith McGilligan, who is a retired uh, Bible teacher, used to teach at the school I went to in uh, Deptford, New Jersey many years ago. Um, he's retired, but he's not retired. We don't retire doing what we do here. And he will be there um, speaking to us via a Zoom link from North Carolina. We're going to be talking about how God's Word is as relevant today as it is ever. We're going to be dealing with prophetic issues, as it, particularly as it is connected to the events of just the last year as well. We're hoping also, like we had last year, Avner Bosky from uh, David's Tent, who is missionary uh, centered in Beersheba, Israel, will join us for a little while during our Bible Prophecy Conference that day and give a report for things that are happening in Israel and um, events subsequent to what's been going on for the last year. If you remember last year, if you attended with us, Abner was there, <clears throat> and um, it was just three weeks after the horrific events of October 7th last year and the beginnings of what has become the Gaza War. So Abner is a, is a very good Bible teacher, and um, we I, I repeatedly speak with him through the year, and he's uh, very graciously agreed to attend with us again that day. I think we're going to try and get him on earlier, maybe at the beginning of the Bob Prosey Conference, because when we brought him in halfway last year, it was already 3 o'clock in the morning uh, in, in Israel, and he hadn't been to sleep yet that night. Anyways, we hope you will join us. September 26th starts at 1 o'clock. Again, physically live, you can join us at the Gathering House in Chesterville, Ontario. Bring your friends, bring others. Uh, we have limited seating there. We need you to email me as soon as possible. Send me an email at ihopecanada at hotmail.com. We are Israel's Hope Ministries. We are a ministry that trusts God to meet our needs on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis by moving God's people to do so. Go to our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org. You'll see there the support us icon, bottom right of the page. Click on that. You can find a way to give a gift. If you have a Canadian bank account, you can make an e-transfer. If you'd like to use PayPal, you hit the live PayPal icon on the page there. It'll bring you directly to our PayPal account, and you can make a direct donation there. Either e-transfer or PayPal are two of the most secure ways to give a donation online. Or if you'd like, find our uh, P.O. Box address in Ottawa on our webpage. Again, www.ihopecanada.org. We hope we are, we you are, we are an encouragement to you. Those looking in on Facebook Live or later on our YouTube channel, if you'd like to go there and check out other messages, our YouTube channel is simply called I Hope Canada. You can find it there. Thanks again for looking in. Let's close our time in prayer. Father God, thank you for Jesus, for eternal life, and everything you do for us. We ask you now to bless the time we've had today and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, until next time, we say, Shalom.